The place that you are standing is holy ground. The Spirit of the Lord is with you. And let's not, let's not underestimate the power and the glory of our Lord Jesus. Everywhere your feet go, the Bible says that you prosper. You bring prosperity wherever your feet land. Today you brought them into the house of God. Later you'll go out into the streets and, and to out for lunch, wherever you're going to go after, after this service. But this is not just in this place. It's wherever you go. That God's spirit is there. God's spirit is among us. Jesus is among us. And I never want to undermine that. That God is in this place. And God is here for you. And he's here for your family. He's here for you just as much as you're here for him. And today, our worlds are going to collide with the heavenly realm. And we're going to be snatched up into a glorious place. We're going to be in that mighty presence of our living God. And would you just stretch your hands this morning and let's just remember where you're standing. The place that you're at is holy ground. And Father, we thank you for your glory in every person that's in this place, every person watching by way of TV. Father, would you just remind them of who you are, of your power, of your glory, of your presence, of your anointing. Just saturate that area. Say, this is the Lord's place. Uh-huh. This is, repeat with me, this is the Lord's place. Now tell your neighbor, this is the Lord's place. Amen, amen. You could have a seat. So this is a 9 a.m. service. You're the ones that are really hungry for God. 11 o'clock, eh, you know, they have to have breakfast and maybe in a light little snack. But most of you haven't even eaten, so I know that you guys are fasting and you're, you're anxious for the word of God. Amen? How many people here, here for the Lord this morning? There are a lot of resistance going on right now in our world. And the temptation, which is what we're going to be talking about today... The temptation is for us to quit, for us to quit, to quit going to church, to quit your marriage, to quit trying to raise a family, to quit your job, to quit even serving God. It can get that, that great. Temptation is designed to cause us to fail. And if you're a Christian in here, you know what it means to be tempted. Some of you are being tempted even right now because temptation never se seems to cease. It'll follow you into places where you think that it would not go. It'll go there. The devil will come to church. The devil will follow people anywhere. It doesn't matter. And so you could even be tempted in a place like this. And so what we want to learn today is how to overcome temptation. Everyone here is tempted in some degree, in some area, in some capacity. Some of the temptations may be different, but we're all tempted in one way or another. Some of us are tempted in the area of addiction. Some of us are tempted in the area of jealousy, of anger, unforgiveness, rage, uh, maybe even a, a lust. Everyone here has to face these temptations. And the idea is that we learn to resist them. Say the word resist. To resist temptation is a powerful weapon. It's a powerful tool that the Lord Jesus left us to have. And if you, if you can acquire this tool to resist temptation, you will live a much better Christian life. 
You'll live a much holier life, a more pure life, a more sanctified life, a more glorious life. How many want to live that life? The life that Jesus lived is available to every single believer. What sets us apart from one another is the ability to resist temptation. Because some of us are better at it than others. And no matter where you're at in this area, you can get better. How many want to get better in this area? Because if you're tired of falling in to the same old traps week after week, month after month, you've fallen into traps and everyone's got to come with you in the trap. Everyone suffers when you're trapped in these temptations. Then you, you must be kind of tired of going through this cycle and you want to break free. And I know what that feels like because I, I want it too. Nobody wants to serve God and be tempted and to fall into sin over and over again. Nobody wants that. Everyone wants to live victoriously. Is that the truth? So we're going to talk today in the book of James chapter 1, and we're going to read just three verses, 12 to 15. Last year, about February, when COVID was kind of at its peak, this is when everybody, I think, was like, everyone was hiding at that point, I think. And we were like, uh, I think we had just bought a bunch of groceries. I think that's how bad it got in my house. My wife wanted, let's just go get some groceries. Let's stock up the freezer. Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. What could it hurt? We'll have a lot of food. Let's go get it. And then they shut down everything. Do you guys remember that? They shut everything down. You guys talk to me a little bit. I, you guys awake out there? All right. You want to eat, don't you? You got to open your mouth if you're going to eat. So everything was shut. Do you guys remember that? Okay, yeah, very good. And, and I'm 51. I don't know how old you are, but I'm 51. And, and so I started going to the gym prior to COVID just so I could stay alive. And when everything shut down, I noticed something happened really quick. My body started to deteriorate. I started to look like, almost like a turtle or something right here in my neck area. And I started to feel like super, super, I don't know, weak, you know, shrivelly, I guess, wrinkled. And I didn't want to feel that way. And so I told my wife, I need to find a gym that's open. And so I started calling around the city to find out if there were any gyms open because mine had closed. And I found one that was open. I called and, and, the, and, I, and the owner answered. I said, are you guys closed? He said, we'll never close. Oh, that's the place I want to go. We'll I want a church like that too. We'll never close. And so I go, oh, perfect. I'll be there in an hour. And so I drove to the gym, and, and, I, and when I pulled up, I noticed some exotic cars all in the parking lot. There were Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Audis, Porsches, and there are just all these exotic cars in front of this gym. And the news media was out there because uh, they were interviewing the owner because they were asking him, why are you open? And... I walked through there behind the camera, and then I got in the, in the shot or in the frame. And so my wife ends up seeing me on the news. Great. The Wayward Outreach is breaking uh, COVID protocols. Great. There's Pastor Joe breaking every rule that the CDC is, is, is adopting. But anyway, I go into the gym. And I noticed, I felt really awkward. And the reason I felt awkward, because I was the smallest guy in the gym. The guys in there were just huge, just ridiculously huge. They looked like they could swallow me in one bite. 
And it wasn't just limited to the guys, it was their wives too and their children. The whole family was just, <laughs> even little children, I'm not kidding you. And I look around and even men who are older than me were so, what is going on at this gym? This ain't like the YMCA where I was at. This is a very different kind of gym. And I felt really awkward because there I am just trying to stay alive and survive COVID. And here were these other people that seemed to have an unreasonable advantage. And I remember that feeling because I had that feeling 30 years ago when I first walked into church. When I first walked into church, I felt like the weakest person in the building. I'm pretty sure I was. Nobody in the building, I don't think, drank a bunch of liquor before, I came, before they came in. And no one in the church, I think, had weed in their pocket. And I look around and I say, there's something different about this place. I certainly am out of place. I certainly am the weakest person in this building. I came to church completely sinful. I came to church not hiding anything. I came to church for a woman, really. And I was in a place in my life where I was not trying to resist anything. I didn't even know what temptation was because it was just part of, what is that? I, I do everything. I was a practicing sinner. I had no clue that there was anything different. Uh, church? I didn't even know there was a place like this. I didn't I've never seen anything like this in my life. Just like that gym, like what is this place? Everybody's huge. And that's how it felt in church. Have you ever anyone else ever experienced that? I can't believe I'm the only one. The problem was, and I'm talking about church, is that I was weak. I was weak. I had no muscle to resist temptation. You have to develop a muscle to resist temptation. A reflex, if you will. You're going to learn something today, boy. I'm, I'm an expert at temptation, I'm telling you. Make sure you write this down. If you've been, if you've been tempted over and over and fall into the same city, you're going to want to write this down. Trust me. The difference between temptation and sin is temptation is merely the gateway to sin. That's the difference. Temptation is the gateway to sin. If you can learn how to close the gate, you can learn how to overcome every temptation. Tell your neighbor, I'm closing the gate. If you can learn how temptation works, you can also learn how to fix it. Because you don't, if you don't know how something works, then you cannot fix it. That's why some of you take your car to a mechanic. Because you don't know how it works. And so you pay people lots of money to fix your car. But those people who know how to fix a car, they save a lot of money and expense because they have the knowledge and the wherewithal to fix their own vehicle. And so you have the ability to fix anything that you understand how it works. You can fix it. 
And that's what we're here to do this morning is we're going to learn how temptation works through James's scriptures. Now let's start by saying this. Jesus conquered sin. We all agree to that? Nobody conquered sin the way that Jesus did. He's unmatched, unparalleled. Nobody like him. Jesus conquered sin, but it, it is your responsibility and my responsibility to conquer temptation. Whose responsibility is it? Mm -hmm. It's mine. Right. Somebody said yours. I heard someone yours. No, it ain't my responsibility. <laughs> you conquer your own. I got my own stuff. My responsibility. Say that with me. It is my responsibility to conquer my temptation. Amen? Jesus conquered sin, but he said, I'm going to give it your responsibility to conquer your temptations. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says that you are no longer a slave to sin. Romans 6.14 says, sin shall not rule over you. Sin is not your master. God is your master. Jesus is your master. The Holy Spirit is your master. You are not a slave to sin. I think there, we sing that in church. I would not be able to sing a song like that in church knowing that I'm a slave to my sin. That's a song I would have to sit out on that one. Because the words would not be conducive to my lifestyle. If I'm sinning and I'm practicing sin and, and I'm not overcoming sin, how can I say that I'm no longer a slave to it? That would be a very hard song to sing for me. Jesus said, sin shall not rule over you. Why, why not? Because he's overcome it. He's overcome every single sin. If we're to be honest, some of us in this room could say, that's not that way for me. It's not that way for me. I still have repetitive sin and temptation going on all the time in my life. And it's really, really hard to be in a church environment when you're that beat down and weighed down with sin. I know how that feels. Trust me. I kept going. I, I went to the gym. I'm still at that gym. I'm still at church because I'm going to plug away and plug away and fight and praise and worship and learn, and I am going to master this thing that is trying to master me. And what we need to do is that we need to learn how to resist temptation. No one has defeated sin and temptation like Jesus. He lived a completely sinless life. If you were to count the days of Jesus' life, it was over 12,000 days of his human life here on this earth with no sin. Over 12,000 days. I'm just trying to last 12 seconds, 12 minutes, 12 days. I, I instituted this thing in my, in my Christian walk when I was very young. How long can I go without sinning? And I would challenge myself. And I, they would help me be aware of temptation. You understand? I'm trying to be clean. I'm trying to be pure. I'm trying to have my mind correct. And so I was super aware that I was on this regimen not to sin. And so I would try it, you know, and, and, and I would mark the day where I stumbled. Oh, man, I did pretty good. It did like three days. Oh, man, that three days turned to three weeks. And just kept growing and growing in this ability not to sin. 
Okay? Now, I'm not saying perfection. Nobody's perfect like Jesus. But the idea is to sin less and less and less and less and less as you mature in the Lord. Amen? If you want to learn how to defeat temptation, how many want to learn how to defeat temptation? Help me up on my mic a little bit. My voice is a little raspy. Give me a little more on this mic. If you want to learn how to defeat temptation, you must learn it from Jesus. Who are you going to learn it from? From Jesus. You have to learn it from Jesus because nobody did it better than Jesus. Do you guys agree? You guys still talking to me, right? You still want to eat, right? Are you full already? Okay. Now, the author here is James, who happens to be the little brother of Jesus. So James has a huge advantage, doesn't he? He lives with Jesus. He lives with them. They share the same room. Jesus, the perfect one, lives in the same room with his younger brother James. I guess even like in a bunk bed. Jesus on the he's on the top bunk for sure. Little James on the bottom bunk. And I, I can imagine if Jesus was my brother, oh my goodness. I would take notes every day. I would have number one bestsellers. If Jesus was my little brother, I would ask him a lot of questions. I'm sure that James must have asked him, how come I'm the only one who gets in trouble? I'm always getting spanked. Mama, Papa, they're always mad at me. But they're never mad at you, Jesus. Why is mom and dad never mad at you, Jesus? Oh, because I'm perfect. <laughs> you sin and I don't. And your sin gets you in trouble. Well, I don't want to sin, Jesus. Will you teach me how not to sin? Sure, little brother. And I write these things down. And I have to believe that James' writings are a reflection of those dialogues he had with his brother Jesus. He didn't forget those talks. So in James chapter 1, verse 12, James starts off by saying this. Blessed are those who endure. Say endure. It means to remain steadfast. Don't give in to. Blessed are those who endure, who remain steadfast. Don't give in to temptation or the invitation to sin. For when they have been approved, say approved. Uh, the word approved is a money term. And it, it's a money term that relates to something of legitimate, genuine weight. Legitimate, genuine weight. So back during these days, they used to cut out steel, copper, uh, silver, gold, and cut it out, and they would actually weigh it on a scale. And if the coin came out weighing the proper amount on a scale, they would say this coin is approved. So any a coin that was approved was administered into the currency of the time. So this, uh, this word approved really replies to, is it a legitimate weight? Blessed are those who endure, remain steadfast, who don't give in to temptation or the invitation of sin. For when they have been approved or they've been approved for legitimate, genuine weight and value, they... Those that have been approved will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed are those who do not give in 
to temptation. Happy are those, joyful are those, content are those who don't give in to temptation. Those that prove that they are legitimate, those whose weight has been proven, that weight can be applied to you and you still stay in your position. That resistance or opposition can come at you and you still hold your position. Blessed are those people who hold and stand fast in their position, who don't give in. They prove that they are legitimate. Those people will receive, the Bible says, a crown of life. Blessed are those people. What does that mean? That means that I cannot be a counterfeit and expect to receive a crown. I can't be fake. I have to carry the weight. How can I preach something that I'm unable to live for myself? How can I do that? I'm disqualified. I have to be able to master it and conquer it for myself so I can show someone else how to do it. Therefore, my weight will be, will be tested to see if I'm legitimate or not. And I, I'm no different than you. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. You're going to be proven. Amen. You got, don't get quiet on me now. So God is not handing out crowns just to anybody. He's not in the business of just handing out crowns. The word crown means this. It means a prize or a symbol of rank given to victors. It's a symbol of rank given to those who are victorious. So when you master, let's say, the temptation of addiction, you receive a crown in the spirit that shows your rank. And that crown is a symbol of your authority over that temptation. So if somebody comes in and has an addiction problem, I'm going to see that guy wearing that crown over there. Go talk to him. He's going to help you out. I must be victorious over my temptation in order to receive this kind of prize. This is a special prize. This is a glorious prize. Mm -hmm. It's a specific price. It's a crown of life. How many want that? I want that. Only like three of you want it. <laughs> I remember when my daughter, <clears throat> and she's not here now. She'll be here at 11, but if I, could, I could kind of make fun of her now. She's not here. Do I have a water? Can I get a water up here, please? Oh, I do have one? Okay. My daughter, when she was in first grade, she was really honory. Like she was a tough cookie, let's just say that. Super rebellious, especially like towards her mom. I didn't believe it till mom caught her on video. This is the daughter I live with. I don't know the one you live with. This is the one I live with. And my daughter was in first grade. She always got in trouble. She never wanted to listen to the teacher. She'd go to the principal. They're just always, always busted. You guys have any kids like that? <laughs> it's so embarrassing because every day we'd get a call. You don't know, be at work and get the call. You're, hey, she's here again. Oh, my gosh. What did she do? And she would come home, and, and she would not do her homework. She wouldn't want to do her homework. Did you do your homework? I did it, Papa. Here's his first grade. Little, I did it, Papa. Okay, he did it. Finds out she didn't do it. She didn't do it. And nor did she want to do it. 
When we knew that she had homework, all right, let's do your homework, baby girl. Uh, I'm tired. And, uh, what's two plus two? I don't know. It was too hard. It's hard. And I sit there, man, I got stuff to do. <laughs> and we'd be like doing homework for like two hours. First grade. I'm like, man, this is not healthy. How can I keep her there doing homework for that long? She's little. And how, I feel sorry for me, too. I'm there, <laughs> too. I got a life, too. And here I am trying to teach my daughter first grade homework. Eventually, I started just to give her the answers. I just give her the answers. Two plus two, four, yeah, write it down, four. Mm -hmm. First president, yeah, George Washington, write it down, write it down. George Washington, G-E-O-R-G-E-W-A, -E write it down, write it down. Just move outside, let me write it. <laughs> I was doing the homework. And then in first grade, graduation came. And here she comes in her, in her graduation robe. And they put a little crown. I go, why are they having graduation in the first grade? Is it because they're not going to make it to the fifth grade? <laughs> or the 10th grade? Or the whatever, 18? Senior? Are they having them at a younger age because no one's graduating? Why are they having them so early? But there she was in her graduation gown. And look at me, Papa, you know, spinning around. He got on stage, and they call her name, and she gets his crown. I'm thinking, like, you don't even deserve that crown. How did you get that crown? Because you ain't done nothing. She getting the crown, took the snatch that crown off her head. Give me that crown. I need that crown. I'm the one who did all the work. <laughs> and God is not doing that. He's not giving crowns to anybody. I know that God wants to give a crown to everyone. He wants every believer to pass their temptation test. I know that. You know, how come I know that? Because he's provided all the answers to the test. This is an open book test. You got your Bible? This is an open book test. God wants you to pass so bad. He wants to see you graduate so bad that he left the answer book to you. Tell your neighbor, open the book. Tell the other neighbor, open the book. If you want to pass the test, all you have to do is open the book. The answers lie within. All your answers on how to resist, how to overcome, how to break free, how to get healed, how to get delivered, how to have a good marriage, how to be prosperous, it is all right there. Open the book. Because I know God wants to give it to me because he gave me all the answers. This is a pass or fail examination. Everyone must pass their own test. I can't take your test for you. That's one thing my daughter, I couldn't go there and actually take the test. So her test, her test scores were, <laughs> they're <were> bad. <laughs> They're really bad. But it's her homework scores that allowed her to pass. She'll be here at 11. I'm, she ain't going to like this, but. Everyone must pass their own test. Tell your neighbor, pass your own test. Shoot. I got my own test to take. Until you learn not to give in, until you learn to hold your ground, the same temptation is going to keep coming to you. True. Until you learn to pass your test and to hold your ground and not give in,
the same test, temptation is going to come around. So you can learn the answers in one year or 10 years. It doesn't matter. It's up to you. It'd be a shame, though, that you're 10 years old and you're still in test number one. You're 10 years old in the faith and you're still taking kindergarten tests. That would be a shame. James chapter 1, verse 13, second verse says this. When you are being tempted, do not say... The actual Greek translation says, stop saying this. When you're tempted, stop saying this, that you're being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. James is writing to the, 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 uh, from Jerusalem to the New Testament church. He's writing to believers, and he's telling them, stop blaming God for your inability to pass your temptation test. There were actually people. Can you imagine? There were actually people in the church blaming God during that time. Oh, my gosh. There's nobody does that, right? Nobody blames God for the chaos and dysfunction. Only this church. Some people say, this temptation is too strong for me. It must be coming from God. God is the one that's opposing me. He's the one that is causing me to fail, causing me to stumble. People actually believe that. God will never do that. God wants you to pass. Uh -huh. God wants you to break through. God wants you to get better. It is the devil who's tempting you. The devil doesn't want you to get better. The devil wants to trap you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy you. And so James has wanted to correct the church. No, it's not God. You can't blame God for your dysfunction. You can't blame God for your weak areas, your sinful areas. You can't blame God for that. You can't blame people. Sorry, husbands, wives. You can't blame your spouse. You can't blame your children for your fits of rage. You can't blame bad drivers. How many of you ever flipped out on somebody on the road? It's their fault, right? You flipped out. You cannot blame anyone but yourself because it is your test to pass or fail. Amen. I know it's hard to clap. Go ahead and clap. Get it out. Yay, yay, yay. Can we go on? Yeah, we're doing good. Verse 14. I love this verse. Watch. But each person is tempted when they are drawn away. Say drawn away. This word drawn away is a hunting term. I love the, the New Testament Bible. You know why? Because uh, it had to be written as they went along. They already had the Old Testament, but the New Testament, they had to kind of explain how Christian living is supposed to look like. And so they had to use a lot of references that the culture could understand at the time. So they're kind of writing it as they go along. There is no pre-existing thoughts or reasonings or faith that, to accompany what they're writing at that time. And so he uses these words, these two words, drawn away, which is really one word, and it describes a hunting term that they could understand. It's a hunting term that means to be lured out from safety. To be drawn away is to, to be lured away out of a safe place. You understand that? 
And so the art of temptation is a luring. You understand? You can feel it when it comes. It's luring you into an emotion, into response, into a lust. It's, it's luring you in. Okay? Each person is tempted when they are drawn away or lured out of safety by their own desires, by their lusts, by their sinful nature. And then enticed or baited. What the writer's trying to say this is that you are being hunted. You're being hunted. The devil's trying to destroy you. He's trying to trap you so that you fail fail out life, fail in your marriage, fail your children. He wants you to quit. You're being hunted. And the hunter is using your own desires. Oh, this is good. The hunter, you already have these desires. These sinful nature desires, these responses, these mindsets, they're already there. But the hunter is capitalizing on them. He knows they're there. In other words, he knows what you like. He knows what you like. And he's trying to bait you. He's trying to lure you in close to him. So that he can trap you and destroy you. So you must learn to control your desires. You must learn to resist the bait. So you have two opportunities to control this and to control that. Control your own desires and control the bait. Because in order for temptation to happen, those two things must merge. I want you to think about all you hunters out there. Think about the whole hunting game. My dad's a hunter. We've hunted when we were kids. I don't hunt anymore, but... My dad still does. And hunting is about luring. It's about luring. It's about drawing in what you're hunting down. There's something that the animal likes, and the hunter knows what they like. And so we get really skilled at baiting them in close for shot. In here, I brought some, some hunting bait. I got different types of bait for different types of animals. Well, I don't. My dad does. My dad's been killing some dove lately, I see. He's got these. These look like moose, no, elk. Y'all hear that? This is the sound of the elk's horns coming together. Why is that important? Because the females come running. They hear the men fighting, and the female are like, huh? <laughs> if it's a testosterone, they're like, huh? I don't know what this one is. I think this is L. Addictions, addiction might be calling you. <laughs> Alcohol might call you. <laughs> 
Budweiser might call you a cooler. <laughs> What's this one? Anger, rage. <laughs> And that dumb animal just, what is that? <laughs> and they get lured into, what's this one? Uh oh, bleat in heat. And here come the men. Is that simple? The devil has tools. Oops. To bait you in. Tools. And if this don't work, I'll use this one. He's trying to hunt you down. Amen? How many are, t are sick of being hunted down? I want to be the hunter. I, I don't want to be hunted down. I want to hunt him down. Until you learn to resist, you'll always get suckered into a trap. Amen? Last verse, verse 15. It says that you're drawn away by your own desires and then enticed. Verse 15, then when your own desire or your lust has conceived, that word means to come together as one or to become pregnant. When your own desire and the devil's enticement come together, pregnancy happens. And as a result, of those two colliding and coming together and becoming one, the Bible says that you give birth to something called sin. And when sin is fully grown, it says that it brings forth or produces or creates death. Why is James using reproductive terms to describe temptation? He's using hunting terms. Now he's using reproductive terms because everybody understands that. When my lust or your lust or your desires and the devil's enticements Conceive together or they become one. Sin is born. You are literally sleeping with the enemy. Sleeping with your enemy. Having interaction with a demon. Is that too deep for a Sunday morning? It is the devil or a demonic force that wants to conceive with your own desires and come together so that pregnancy can evolve and infancy can evolve and a sin will be born and the two coming together. It's having interaction with the demonic spirit and it can get really dark and really weird. Pornography, super weird, super dark. The deeper you go. And you're being baited. And you're having conception with a demonic power. Is that possible? In Genesis chapter 6, the Bible talks about fallen angels who had slept with human women and generated a, a race of just weirdos, giants. It was, a, it was a depiction of sin. It was a depiction of sin. When desires and demons sleep together, 
conception takes place and sin is born. I praise the Lord, somebody. You guys get quiet today, my goodness. And the result are little sin babies walking around. Little sin babies walking around. And we walk around with them and we bring them everywhere we go. Babies of rebellion, babies of addiction. This is my middle daughter, Envy. And the little guy over there, he's little liar. Oh, he looks just like you. Oh. I thought he looked like his mom. Doesn't he look like his mom? No. No, he, he looks just like you. And they may look cute at first. Ever saw a baby look cute at first? They grew up in the, never mind. <laughs> and the sin and the conception in the baby is cute at first. But later on, it grows teeth. And it wants to kill you. Amen? What are you saying, Pastor Joe? I'm saying that sin, it has a reproductive cycle. Temptation, lust, desires, enticements coming together, producing a cycle of sin. Are you in a sin cycle? And your sin is repeating over and over and over again because you have not the power to resist temptation. God help us. Temptation requires your consent. It requires your consent. If you refuse to consent, it's impossible to conceive. Refuse to consent, impossible to conceive. Refuse to cooperate. Well, I ain't co cooperating with that. I ain't doing that. No, we ain't doing that. Get out of here. I bind you. I refuse you. I resist you in the faith. I say no to you, demon. In the name of Jesus, take your position. <laughs> refuse to cooperate and overcome temptation. James 4, 3 says, resist, say resist. Resist the devil and he will what? He'll what? Flee. Where will he flee? I don't know, but not, he ain't coming here. You can go to the Garcia family up the street, the Martinez's around the block. I don't care where you go, but you ain't living here. You don't pay rent here. You can't live here. You need to get out of this house right now. <laughs> Resist the devil and he will what? Flee. You need to get a muscle in you that resists the devil. I'm talking every single one. I don't care how much he comes at you. You got to learn to resist him and fight him back. <laughs> well, Pastor, I'm tired. It doesn't matter. Then keep having babies. Good morning, Wayward Outreach. <laughs> Let's all stand to our feet. Did you guys get something? Yeah. Now you get to go practice. Oh, praise God. You get to go practice. Leave that there for a moment. You could take that, but leave this. Practice resisting. Practice. Some of you are going to practice just leaving these doors. 
your patience will be practiced when you get in the line at Kids World. Mm. Practice will reconvene itself maybe in the car. I'm hungry. <laughs> And when you get home, maybe tomorrow on the job, practice again. And you practice, and you practice, and you practice, and you resist, and you resist, and you become like those guys in the gym. You look like that in the spirit. You just, you're like, dang, what's, what have you been doing? I'm just going to church. What's up? You look different. Yeah, right on. Should look different. Amen. Did you guys enjoy this? And what we're going to do right now is we're going to invite people up. People that are, I'm going to challenge you that you say, I'm going to make a stand right now to resist in. I've not resisted. At least I've, maybe I've tried and I've failed, but. Today, I'm going to make a stand to resist temptation that's coming against me. I'm going to read one verse. And we're going to invite you up. Those who are tired of being hunted. And you say, I want to resist. I want to, I'm going to stop this. As a matter of fact, we're going to war against this thing. I want to invite you up if, to, if you want to make that choice. You're falling into temptation of, of pornography, lust, addiction, fear. Right now in this world, we have a demon of fear saturating our, 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 uh, our world, our cities. Everyone's afraid to go out, even to go outside. My goodness. The earth is the Lord and all the things they are in. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I healed all your diseases. Whether I, but I need to believe that. Every disease. Disease don't determine what I do. God determines what I do. I'm going to the house of the Lord because that's what he tells me to do. Come up to the house of the Lord. Praise ye in my sanctuary. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. First Corinthians 13, 10, 13 says this, no temptation. Say no temptation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience. In other words, nothing unusual or beyond human resistance. Your, your temptation is no different or special than any others. Oh, you don't understand. Yes, I do. You don't have a special circumstance or case. Every temptation that we experience is common to mankind. Everyone experiences at different levels. So let's not put our temptation in a, in a, a deified state. Let's not worship our temptation or our failure. He says, but God. Say that with me, but God. That just sounds good. Tell somebody, but God. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy. And God will not let me be tempted beyond my ability to resist. But with every temptation, say every one, God will always provide a way out. An escape route. When temptation comes, look for the escape route because he said that he would provide you one so that you will be able 
to endure it or the power to overcome it. It is your temptation to overcome. Are you ready to overcome it? Let's all lift our hands. If you're in this building, stretch your hands out, close your eyes, worship God. I'm ready to come against my tempter, my hunter. I'm ready to stand. If that's you here today, I want you just to work your way out. Everyone else, just keep your hands up. We're going to worship God during this time. A few folks start getting out of seat. Now's the time we want to get out of seat. Come forward. So we want to take your position. Take your stand. People with their hands lifted up, just keep praying. People are coming forward. People are coming forward. Just keep worshiping God. Keep worshiping God. If you have been failing at a, at a temptation, you just you have sin in your life and, and you can't seem to overcome it, I'm going to invite you to come up now. Go ahead and get out of your seat and do that. Come on, you're just saying, I want to overcome. I am going to overcome by the, by, the, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. I'm going to overcome this thing. I'm coming out of my seat right now, and I'm going to face this thing head on. Don't let your hands get tired. I know it's 9 a.m. Some of you haven't been to the gym in a long time. It's hard to hold your hand up. I can see that. My arms are heavy. Keep them up. Praise the Lord. Anyone else come forward? If you need prayer for anything else, come forward for healing. I know right now we have, we, there's anointing here for healing. If you're sick in body, you have a family member who's sick in body. I saw a man yesterday. He came out of, uh, what do you call them when, when, they're, when they're being sustained by their life uh, in ICU? Life support. Thank you. He was on life support for five days. He came out yesterday praising God. He bursts out of life support. All of a sudden, his lungs open up. He's like, turn the machine off. He's healed. You could be healed right now. You could, you, could, you stand in proxy for a family member to be healed right now. If you have a family member that needs a healing, come up right now and get into intercession for them right now. Thank you, Jesus. Look at all these beautiful folks that come up. Why don't you give him a round of applause? We're so proud of you. So proud of you. Great job. Lift your hands because that's a symbol of victory. Victory over temptation. Jesus, say this with me. Jesus, you have the victory over sin. And it is my responsibility to overcome and have victory over my temptation Satan I resist you now in the faith I will not give in any longer I belong to Jesus Jesus come in fill me now with your word with your spirit and with your power enable me Jesus give me the strength and the ability to say no Help me, Lord, to overcome. I thank you for your amazing grace, your loving forgiveness, your loving kindness. I thank you, Jesus. Raise your hands. The anointing's here right now on this little spot. Lay hands on them. Lay, lay, go ahead, touch them. Touch their head. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Beautiful. Hallelujah. Who here came for a healing? Who's here up for a healing? You right here, sweetie. Jesus, you're the great physician. You're the author and finisher of our faith. You're above all things. You're above cancer. Uh-huh, you're above diabetes. You're above anything, God. And we're expecting a miracle to take place, a healing take place. The signs of wonder will follow those who believe. In my name, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I thank you, Jesus.